Good evening. I invite you to open your Bibles, if you would, please, to Luke chapter 14. Uh, put your bookmark there. We're going to spend all our time in this passage of Scripture this evening. Uh, good to see you tonight. Welcome those of you that might be visiting with us. I hope that our study will be of some profit to you. Uh, we are starting a new month, as uh, John Tom and John Polk and Devin all mentioned this morning. Uh, our memory verse, as we're talking about Jesus as Lord, uh, is from Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. And by the way, if, if you weren't able to hear uh, Devin's lesson this morning, I would highly recommend that you go back uh, when you have uh, the opportunity and do so. Did an excellent job introducing this topic. Uh, our memory verse again, Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. If you want to say this with me. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Uh, Luke chapter 14. Uh, this, this passage of Scripture begins with uh, one of the Pharisees. And, and by the way, there's a number of times where Jesus interacts in the New Testament with the Pharisees. Uh, and if you haven't thought it through, he's not dealing with the same group of people every time. He's in different towns. He's in Galilee. He's in Judea. He's in Perea. Uh, he's in, there would have been Pharisees connected with all the synagogues in pretty much every town. And so Jesus, not always when you see him dealing with the Pharisees, not always dealing with the Pharisees, he was dealing with the chapter before. And that is the case here. Uh, in Luke chapter 14, as the chapter begins, Jesus is invited to one of the Pharisees' houses to eat on a Sabbath day. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. We're going to talk about this as we uh, move along through this little study this evening. If you had the opportunity to sit down with Jesus over a meal, what would you talk about? Uh, that maybe the question would be, would you talk at all? Uh, and, and if you did, uh, what would be your questions? And, and would you find it fascinating that, as Devin well pointed out this morning, the Lord of the universe who is in authority over everything because He was raised from the dead, you have the opportunity to listen to Him. And, and would you do so listening to Him as the Lord of the universe? Jesus had this wonderful ability to take everyday circumstances and turn the minds of the people that are involved in those circumstances toward spiritual things. We see this happen all the times in the Gospels. Uh, in uh, John chapter 4, Jesus talks to a woman at the well, and before it's all said and done, they're talking about Jesus and whether He's the Messiah and what this woman needs to do in regards to her soul. John chapter 6, uh, Jesus uh, feeds 5,000 people and they follow Him back across the Sea of Galilee. And they're looking for more food. And Jesus talks to them about His being the bread of life. And they're uh, confronting whether or not they understand that He is the key to spiritual life. Luke chapter 13, they come to Jesus with a political question, remarking about uh, the people, the Galileans that Pilate had killed, mingled their blood with their sacrifices. And before it's all said and done, Jesus is telling them how important it is for them to repent. He had this wonderful ability to turn our attention to spiritual things, and that's what he does in Luke chapter 14. Uh, the, as, this, as this meal uh, proceeds, I want you to appreciate how this chapter, we're, we're really going to look at the, the first 24 verses, uh, two sections, two points. Now, I want you to think about this, by the way. This is a historic occasion. Two sermons, both of them only have two points. What are the odds of that happening in your lifetime? Uh, you can tell COVID has really messed the world up. Uh, two points this evening. We're going to look at the, at the first 14 verses. Because this involves a discussion Jesus has with these Pharisees at, uh, at this supper. Uh, and, and, and what I want you to appreciate is this context through the first 24 verses is all taking place as they're sitting there eating together. Uh, and Jesus is going to, I, I think probably turn the table somewhat. I want you to notice the first verse that says they were watching Him closely. Uh, if you back up a, a chapter or two, a similar circumstance takes place in chapter 11 where they invite Jesus to, to dinner and they ask Him questions and they're trying very hard to discredit Him. 
I don't know for sure that that's what's happening in Luke chapter 14. Uh, I don't know if they're trying to find a way to entrap Jesus, if they're trying to find a way to discredit Jesus, or if they're just so curious about this man and all that he can do that they're just ex exceptionally attentive. I, I, I do believe that there is some suspicion here. And what I want you to appreciate is what Jesus is going to do. While they are looking at Him closely, uh, I'm going to propose probably with the idea of finding some criticism. What's going to happen is Jesus is, by the time this meal is over, He's going to offer some critique of them. And I want to learn a couple of lessons from that. And then as we get to the, the latter part uh, in verse 15, Jesus is going to tell a parable that is uh, fairly familiar to us, and I want to make an observation about that. So uh, let's read, if you would, with me the first 14 verses, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll make an observation about, about this section of Scripture. Now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath that they watched him closely. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy, we would say edema, a swelling of some kind. And Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent. And he took him and he healed him and he let him go. And he answered them saying, Which of you having a donkey or an ox? And by the way, you may be reading a version that says, Which of you having a son or an ox? that has fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day. And they could not answer him regarding these things. So he told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, When you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him, and he who invited you and him come and say to you, Give place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit down in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, Friend, go up higher. Then you'll have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then he also said to him who invited him, When you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, your rich neighbors, lest they invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When you read a passage like this, do you ever think, you know, I wonder what those guys at the table thought about Jesus' comments. Because if my suspicion's true, and they're watching him closely to find something to criticize about him, as they're talking, the next thing you know, he's pointing out this about the guests, and this about the, 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 the people in general, and this about the host. And before it's all said and done, either everybody's confused, everybody's shamed, or everybody's mad. I want you to appreciate what Jesus does here, and I think it's a, a good point for us to consider. I think Jesus offers to these men some observations about the danger of subtle sin. Uh, all of the things that he says in these first 14 verses are intended to cause these people to examine themselves and examine themselves in areas that we don't usually think of that are necessarily all that bad. And so let me ask you as we start down this little trail... When you talk about sin, when somebody, when somebody addresses sin generally, what, what, what do you think of when you think of sin? What are your concepts involving the idea of the transgression of the law of God or the defiance of the Lord God? I, I think probably most of us, and, 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 and this may not be true of you in, in general, but I think most of us tend to think of sin first in regards to base immorality. Is that true? I'm not saying is that the only way you think of sin, but is that kind of the first thing that pops in your mind? Uh, and, and that's easy to do so. Uh, Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and uh, I, I think this generally would receive a hearty amen from most godly people, uh, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And we read that and go, yeah, that's, that's bad folks right there. But if you go back over to Luke chapter 14, I want you to notice that Jesus doesn't address anything like that to these men. He doesn't say, woe to you, uh, scribes and, and Pharisees and lawyers, you, you bunch of hypocrites, uh, because you're a bunch of adulterers or because you're a bunch of extortioners. Now, there are times when Jesus is very critical of the Pharisees. In fact, if you go over to Matthew 23, he warns his disciples uh, about the scribes and the Pharisees who he says, sit in Moses' seat and the things that they tell you to do, you need to do, but don't do what they do do, do what they say, they are hypocrites. And, and to some degree, that's where Jesus goes at this point. He's going to address things that are subtle. Sins that we don't often think about. Sins essentially that, 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 are, that are for the most part selfish kinds of sins. Uh, and, and I'm not sure that we often... I, I know in our world generally, and Devin pointed out this this morning, in our world generally we think of Oh, good moral people, good decent people, people that don't do the things we just read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Those are good folks, and Devin well pointed out. That doesn't mean that you've repented. It doesn't mean you've done everything that God says to do. I think what Jesus challenges these people to do is to examine themselves in ways that maybe they haven't before because they, like us, didn't always see sin for, for the subtlety that's behind it. The first instance in, in, in this chapter, uh, he asked them if it's law, lawful to, to heal on the Sabbath. And I want you to notice that nobody says anything. This is a repeated issue that Jesus deal with in, in, with the Pharisees and the religious people of his day. And, and I think what he's going to challenge in them is, is, is the reality of their conviction. And so here, here's the application I'm going to make of this. Does my religious conviction actually make me, in practice and in thought, more godly? Does my religious conviction, my beliefs, my faith, my profession, does it change me? Does it make me more godly? And so he asks them this question, and, and they, they refuse to answer. And the reason that they refuse to answer is because of their adherence to rituals having to do with the Sabbath day. And so he says, is it lawful? And they kept silent, so he takes the man and he heals them. I, I want you to appreciate, and probably the, the best thing to do is just turn back one chapter. Um, the question that he's facing these men is, okay, you're religious men, and probably what you're thinking right now is it's not lawful to heal on the Sabbath. And so, so what Jesus asked them is if you had a child or an animal and it, and it fell in, 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 on the Sabbath, would, would you go pull it out? And, and the answer is, well, sure, everyone. If you go back one chapter, Jesus uh, in verse 14, uh, excuse me, in verse 10, it says it's teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and he said to her, Woman, you're loosed from your infirmity. And he laid hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, There are six days on which men could be healed. Uh, oh, six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them. Do not come on the Sabbath day. And Jesus said, hypocrite. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years be loose from the bond on the Sabbath day. I, I want you to appreciate what Jesus is saying here is, you have become so wrapped up in your traditions and your convictions and your rules that you have missed things like compassion and mercy and kindness and gentleness and benevolence and, and, and love for other people. It's a pretty simple uh, accusation, and I, I don't think that there's probably anybody here who doesn't get it. 
The question is, how do we apply it? You know, we, we, don't, we don't observe the Sabbath day. Okay? And, and, and even when it comes to Sunday uh, and the day that we worship the Lord, we don't have a bunch of rules and regulations about what you can and can't do outside of worship on the, on, on the Lord's day. Uh, but we do have other things that we tend to use to measure our spiritual life and whether or not we're faithful to God. To these people, if you kept all the Sabbath day rules, then you were faithful. And if this woman over here in chapter 13, who hadn't been able to stand up for 18 years, well, she should have just come on Friday or she can wait and come on Sunday. Just don't do it on the Sabbath day. And Jesus is amazed at that. For all of their religious conviction, and they were very convicted, it really wasn't changing them inside. And, and, and that's one of those subtle things that I think all of us need to be aware of, that our service to God, it, it, we do measure it in our attendance, we do measure it in our Bible study, we measure it in our reading, we measure it in a lot of external ways. The question is, what is it doing to really change me? Am I just showing up? Am, am I just going through the motions? Am I a more godly person in practical ways than I was last year? And if not, why not? And, and what am I going to do to amend that? Because the reality is that having re religious conviction doesn't necessarily change you. Go back to the text and, and look at verse 7. Uh, he's watching as they are gathering to eat. And he's watching how that they are choosing the best places. Uh, this has been discussed several times, and, and without going into uh, great detail, they would have sat at uh, 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 probably a series of tables that formed a kind of a U, all right? And they would have sat around the outside of it, uh, generally three to a table. And the person sitting in the middle would be uh, not in the chief seat. It would be the person sitting farthest to the right because they would have reclined on their elbow. And, and, and so people would choose the best seats and the best seats were measured by how you could see everybody and who was esteemed as the most visible and kind of the centerpiece. Uh, we don't do things that way, but that's the way they did things. And so Jesus, as He is watching them in verse 7, He's watching them jockey for position of esteem and respect as they sit down to eat. And so Jesus tells them, look, when you're invited to, to a wedding feast, don't sit down at the best place. It's one more honorable than you be invited. And uh, the, the host comes to you and brings him and says, hey, get out of the way. This guy gets to sit there. You go sit down at the very end of the table. Uh, and, and then you, you're, you're shamed. Uh, verse 10, I... I often wonder if verse 10 is somewhat sarcastic, if it's ironic, but be, because he says, when you're invited, go sit down in the lowest place, so when he invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go higher up, as if there's some kind of uh, uh, false uh, humility. Now, I'm going to sit here, but I'm going to sit here because I know I don't belong here, and he's going to move me farther up the chain. I, I don't know if Jesus is saying that, but it sounds like he may be. And so if he is, that's somewhat sarcastic. Then you'll have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. But he makes the point in verse 11, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Here Jesus is challenging their motivations. Why are you doing what you're doing? And, and so this raises this question about subtle sin to us. What's driving you in your life? Are we being driven by self-interest? By how we are perceived, by what we get, by how I am uh, going to come out of whatever situation I find myself? Or are we driven by selfless humility? Because the reality is ambition for honor and recognition and esteem is, is just another way of saying selfishness. And, and it is rampant in our world. It's rampant in our society. It's rampant among God's people. And, and, and I don't think we often stop and look at ourselves and ask ourselves honestly why we're doing what we're doing. Are we 
Are we doing anything in our life out of the desire for recognition or praise or, 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 or some kind of elevation? In verse 11, this, this statement, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted, is a concept that we find used by the Lord in a lot of places. In, in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn. Uh, th- those are concepts whereby what God expects of His people is, is that we put ourselves the lowest possible place. Not so that someone will pull us up higher, but just so that we put ourselves in a position of service and honor and love for God. And, and all we're really interested in is being exalted by God. Now, and I'm going to tell you, that's a hard quality to develop. This idea of uh, anonymity, this idea that it doesn't really matter if anybody sees what I do, if, 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 if my work is ever recognized, that there is something in us that, that almost strives for some kind of recognition. Jesus' apostles had an ongoing fight. Three different times we're told that they had a dispute about which one of them was going to be the greatest. Now these are guys that spent three years listening to Jesus. I don't know how many times they would have heard the Sermon on the Mount. A bunch. And yet, what we see in their little group is, well, you know, I, 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 I just want my voice to be heard. I just want to make an impact. I just... It's really subtle, folks, in a society that so prizes competition and glorification and uh, self... Uh, Self-promotion, it, it, it is a dangerous, dangerous and subtle thing when we quit thinking about everybody else and just start thinking about how this is going to reflect on me. And that's what Jesus does. And then go back to the text and he does one other thing here, addressing these kind of subtle things whereby he's challenging them to examine themselves. Verse 12, then he said to the one who invited him, uh, next time you go eat with somebody, make sure you insult the host. Okay, make sure make sure you criticize them about how, the, because that's what he does. Uh, when you give a dinner or a supper, don't ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, your rich neighbors. Okay, now who do you think's at this feast? Uh, it, it's obviously not in verse thirteen, the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind, or Jesus wouldn't have to be saying this. So he's telling this man, look around the room. You have invited the wrong people. Because what's happening is, in verse 12, is they're, they're just going to invite you back, and there's going to be this just give and take, uh, you, you owe me. I, I, have a, I have an old friend that used to, uh, he'd, he'd do something nice for you, and you'd try to pay him back, and he'd say, I want you indebted to me. Okay? Uh, and then you feel indebted to him. And then you feel like you've got to do something back, and you do something back. And you do something back, and then you tell them, I, well, I want you to feel indebted to me. Uh, and then it just back. Well, that's the kind of mentality that Jesus is addressing. Only in a real sense, in a serious sense. And so what he tells them is, if you really want your service to be serious, you need, you need to examine your disposition. And so the question that, that comes to us is, are, are we being benevolent and hospitable and kind and good and charitable? Are we doing the good things that God asks us to do because of what we get out of it? Or are we really trying to make a difference in the lives of somebody else and serve the Lord? Now, you, you read these, and they're, they're, they're pretty self-evident to me, and I, I can see why Jesus made people mad on a pretty regular basis. You, you don't typically go to somebody's house and say things like this. Uh, but the challenge is, to me, to, to use this kind of example and make sure that I'm not being what they're being. They're religious men, they're moral men. By measures of our world standards, they would be very godly men. 
And yet Jesus challenges their motivations and their dispositions and whether or not their religion is really changing them at all. And I think those are important things for, for those of us that are really seriously trying to serve the Lord. Those are important things to reflect on. Now, point number two. Let's go to the, to the last verses here in this parable, beginning in verse 15. Uh, and, and at this point, uh, again, we're still in the meal. One of those who sat at the table with him heard these things and said, Blessed is he who, who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Uh, um, I don't know if he's trying to change the subject. I don't know if he's recognizing that Jesus is holding them all to a higher standard. I'd like to give the guy credit for that. But, but essentially, he's looking to the kingdom that Devin talked about this morning and how things are going to be in that kingdom and that these are really the people that are going to be blessed. Jesus has just in verse 14 talked about being blessed and repaid at the resurrection. And so, well, ble- that's, there's the blessed man who, who eats bread in the kingdom. So Jesus offers a story about another man who gives a supper. And remember, he offers a story about a man who gives a supper while he's enjoying the hospitality of a man who gives a supper. Okay, so this gives extra meaning. A certain man gave a great supper and invited many. He sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said, I bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. And the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. The servant said, Master, it's done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go into the highways and hedges, compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. I'd like to make this application here. Just one point. I think it's imperative that we continue to appreciate the value of the blessings of God. The value of the supper. And and there's a lot of irony going on here in in a lot of ways in this parable. Uh, Because one of the men that's the subject of the parable says, well, the man's blessed that's going to be a part of the kingdom. Before the parable's over, basically what Jesus says, none of you all are going to be here. Not unless you do some changing. The people that were invited, they're not going to get to come. Who is it that's going to get to come? Well, did you notice it's the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind? The exact description that he told the Pharisee a few verses earlier, these are the people you need to invite if you want to be repaid. Those are the people that God's going to accept. They're the ones that are going to appreciate the great supper. And and that's the thing I think probably we need to see here. Jesus portrays God's provision in terms that if it was an earthly thing, we would be excited about. God's given a great feast. Who doesn't want to go to a great feast? Who doesn't want to show up? Who doesn't want to be a part and and enjoy the blessings that the Master has provided? And that's the irony of the parable because He's already invited them. It's this great thing. That's what they're all enjoying right now. And Jesus says, imagine another feast like this feast. Only instead of showing up like you all have, you start making excuses. And notice that that's the way that Jesus says it. They all began to make excuses. We understand the difference between an excuse and something valid, right? And, and, and Jesus makes this point. And the excuses we think of as pretty valid things. Well, here's a guy that maybe he's a, a property, maybe he buys and sells for a living and he's bought a piece of property and he needs to go check it out. Uh, Here's somebody else that's a farmer and he's bought some oxen. Uh, These are important tools in his work. He needs to go try them. I look at that and the first thing I think of is who's going to buy a piece of property sight unseen and who's going to go buy oxen that he hasn't tested already? And so as you start looking at it, the, the excuses start breaking down. Are they important things? Yes, they are. Last guy says, hey, I've... I've taken a wife. He doesn't even offer an excuse. He just says, I can't come. And and here's the the, the master, it becomes angry. I wonder if the Pharisee giving the meal that Jesus is sitting at, 
If the same men in the room had said, I can't come over because I've, I've bought some oxen. My oxen are more important than your supper. I, I've, I bought a piece of land. My piece of land is more important than coming in and enjoying your hospitality. I, I married a wife and I'm, I'm just not going to show up. I'm, I'm not coming because there's family things that are going on. And we look at that and while we might understand, okay, well, I get that. At the same time, if you've gone to the trouble to make something festive and enjoyable for someone else and then they don't come for things that obviously could be rescheduled, how would that make you feel? I want you to appreciate that what Jesus is telling these Pharisees is all your reasons for not accepting my lordship are just excuses in the eyes of God. And just because you're spiritually esteemed, because you're religious men, doesn't mean that your reasons, even though they might be reasons that in temporal terms are fairly significant, they're not as significant as is the supper, the provision of the Master. I'm going to tell you something that seems to me that happens to us as we serve the Lord and as we go along. Uh, we become, I don't know, uh, it's not immune necessarily. We, we, we just become so accustomed to what God asks of us and what God has done for us that, that we lose the sense of perspective about what's the most important thing, what's the most valuable thing. And, and for these men, it must have stung them when Jesus says, look, the guys that originally invited, and I think they would have gotten this, especially when he talks about going out into the highways and the hedges. Because he's already said, get the ones you wouldn't have invited to your feast. That's who, in the kingdom, the king is going to have. And the highways and the hedges to the Jews... They understood that Jesus is talking about the Gentiles. I don't think there would have been any mistake in their mind that Jesus is talking about those who are cast out. And yet they're pulled in and the ones originally invited don't get to come. How that must have stung them. But after hundreds of years of their traditions and their going through the motions and their failure to take advantage of the Sabbath day and what it should really mean, or the Passover and what it should really mean, or the Day of Atonement and what it should really mean, and all of these feasts and all of these commemorations that God has offered to them, because they had become rote and trivial in their eyes, the feast wasn't important anymore and they didn't see the blessings. The resurrection of Jesus, as Devin well said this morning, is worth celebrating and prizing more highly than anything. And I'm not just talking about coming to worship, folks. I do think that's important, but that's not the, the bigger point. When we get in our mind how blessed we are at what, because of what God has done, redemption, salvation, resurrection, our resurrection, glorification, Heaven, association with God, association with the saints. And then you just look at earthly. We have forgiveness of sins here. We have hope. We have a family. We have people that care about us. We have all of these blessings that God has given us. And how often do we really stop and appreciate that it is a feast we are enjoying? And how often do we just consider it a, a weary burden that I can make a flimsy excuse and not celebrate at all? These are subtle things that Jesus is addressing to religious people. And yet as I read them, uh, boy, I, I tell you, there are parts of it it's just like looking in a mirror and I don't like the picture I see. And, and, and as Christians, I think it's important that we take passages of Scripture like this and not just see what Jesus is saying to those men, but see how it fits us. Because we're subject to subtle sins too. And we're subject as well to not appreciating the blessings of God. So I hope that will give you some stuff to think about as you go through the week, things that we can work on, things that we will make us better, things that our Lord 
expects us uh, to, to come to an appreciation of. Uh, so, if you ever got a chance to sit down and eat with the Lord, what would you say? And would you listen if He said the very thing to you that He said to them that day? If you're subject to the invitation tonight, we could help you. We invite your response while we sing two.